like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. So welcome and thanks for joining us with the National University of Singapore Yonglu Lin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity webinar series. We have another exciting discussion today on aging biomarkers with Alex Javrankov, the CEO of Insilico Medicine. But before we do that, I want to remind you of one thing, uh, which is to use the Q&A function to ask questions and we will try to get those questions to Alex later in the show. And I also want to introduce, uh, reintroduce, uh, uh, Hi to Tip Tisina, who's one of our postdoctoral fellows, who's going to tell you about a recent paper in the aging field on biomarkers of aging and lung function. So thank you, Brian, for your kind introduction, and thanks everyone for your attention. When talking about aging, we usually imagine ourselves becoming weaker or less and less healthy over time. As we age, we gradually realize that our body doesn't function as well as it used to be. Importantly though, many of us also know that chronological age is not always the same as biological age. Biologically speaking, not everyone ages at the same speed and not every organ ages equally. That is why many researchers have been looking for biomarkers of aging in order to predict biological age of human. So these biomarkers could be based on epigenetics, genetics, transcriptomic, proteomic, metabolomic, or any other data. In the study that I'm presenting today, it was published about uh, six, seven months ago. Professor Schwartz's group at Harvard University was trying to determine the association between biomarkers of aging and the aging of the lung. The latter was characterized by lung function decline. They recruited nearly 700 um, healthy white men um, in, to partici participate in the study. The reason why they focus on these uh, uh, men only is to remove the gender effect from the study. So these participants visited the hospital two to three times across 14 years, during which their DNA samples were collected and the lung function was measured. So DNA was extracted from blood and from DNA samples, they got, uh, the researchers got epigenetics and non-epigenetic biomarkers information. Five epigenetic biomarkers are based on DNA methylation and two non-epigenetic biomarkers are based on telomere length and mitochondrial DNA copy number. Lung function was uh, represented by three different scores and uh, these are measured by spirometry. Here are the results of their studies. Um, in brief, among seven biomarkers of aging that they look at, the study found that Grimage is associated with all three scores of lung function. And so is Zhang's DNA methylation rate score. This means that lung, when lung function declines over time, we are likely to observe the increase of these two biomarkers. 
IEAA is only associated with FV, FEV1, FEC, while other biomarkers show no association. These findings indicate that telomere length and mitochondrial DNA methylation uh, or copy number are unlikely to explain lung function decline in aging population. On the contrary, epigenetic clock could provide a clue on how lung function in some individuals decline faster than others. One of the next interesting questions would be, are the, there are differences in lung function of smokers and non-smokers in terms of its association with biomarkers of aging? When stratified smoking status of participants, the researchers found that lung function decline in never smokers is only associated with chronological age, but not biological age. Um, that would mean that, um, so they only observe epigenetic biomarkers of aging significantly associated with lung function in smokers only. This means that epigenetic changes could be involved in premature lung aging in the smokers. So epigenetic intervention could be a potential approach to delay aging in this vulnerable group. I think this is an exciting report that established the link between epigenetic biomarkers of aging and the lung function decline, but we are still far from the end. So even though telomere lens and DNA, uh, mitochondrial DNA copy number are not associated with lung function, don't forget that this study did not really look at other uh, biomarkers of aging. Transcriptomic clock, for example, was reported to predict premature lung aging in mice. And another study published just last month was uh, also suggests that aging associated transcriptome, uh, transcriptome could explain COVID-19 severity in older population. So I think the take home here is that these studies, uh, um, uh, these studies they show the links between lung aging and some biomarkers of aging in general, but causal relationships re uh, remain to be investigated. So um, since this current cohort only focus on wh white men, um, future studies should look into women and also Asian or African populations. These findings could provide more clues in uh, other interventions that could help to maintain lung health, especially in susceptible groups. That's all from me today. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Aim. Uh, and uh, it's great pleasure to introduce Alex. I've known you for, I guess, I think the first time we met, you were driving me around Moscow about a about a decade ago, um, which is an adventure in itself. Uh, but today we're going to uh, focus on aging. And Alex is the uh, founder and CEO of Insilico Medicine, uh, which is a leader in next generation AI based technologies and drug discovery, and also the founder and CEO of Deep Longevity, which is a global company looking for AI based biomarkers of aging and longevity. He's made a lot of discoveries in this field and is certainly one of the leaders in thinking about this. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have you on, Alex, and I, I'll turn it over to you for the presentation. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to reconnect. Uh, and I must say uh, thank you to, to, to you and also to the National uh, um, University of Singapore uh, uh, medicine. Uh, it's uh, really amazing what Singapore is doing in this area because uh, Singapore managed to prioritize longevity. Uh, and, you know, they're always in a trend. So it means that this is the trend. Uh, and they brought some of the thought leaders uh, to Singapore. So it's really amazing. Uh, and uh, uh, also one highlight is that we, uh, so Brian and I, we uh, previously also co-run um, co-chaired a forum together in Basel uh, in Switzerland called uh, uh, ARDD, so Aging Research for Drug Discovery, uh, now chaired by Morten Schreiber-Knudsen in Singapore, oh, sorry, in uh, Copenhagen. So I'll share my screen and tell you a little bit about what we do. So as uh, Brian correctly uh, pointed out, so I'm uh, the founder and CEO of Insilico Medicine. That's my primary affiliation and that's uh, that's my life. Um, I don't have a family, don't have, uh, you know, uh, uh, a girlfriend. I just have uh, my two uh, companies, uh, and uh, 
uh, Deep Longevity is a spin-off out of Insilico. Uh, it specifically focuses on biomarkers of aging, and it has been acquired by a publicly traded company just recently in Hong Kong. Uh, so that's why uh, this disclaimer um, uh, that it's not an investment advice or not, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, not, not a commercial presentation in this context, even though we try to commercialize uh, uh, aging research as well, because I think it's extremely important to put uh, um, research in the hands of consumers in order for us to go mainstream, because we've been talking about aging research for a very long time. Uh, it's extremely important for us to start doing something about it in the consumer space. Uh, so the fundamental problem of, a of nature, and that's something that kind of disturbs me a lot, is that uh, we grow, mature, peak, and then we continuously decline and eventually die. Uh, and uh, uh, whatever you do, uh, you know, regardless of how much money you make, it really doesn't matter. You are going to, uh, uh, to, to decline and die. And that is a very uncomfortable thought, but I think that just like with alcoholism, uh, you know, the recognition of a problem is the first step to, to, to the solution. Uh, and uh, we need to figure out what to do, right? So you, of course, can prevent uh, and uh, figure out how to uh, delay the inevitable. Uh, and, you know, you don't uh, fly business class to arrive earlier. So, of course, it's, uh, you know, the wealthier people, they allow uh, themselves to live a little bit longer for many reasons. Um, and uh, they can do more preventative uh, medicine, more uh, uh, exercise. Uh, people starve themselves uh, for, for longevity. Um, and uh, eventually what we need to figure out is how to track, repair, and improve. And the sooner we start uh, going massive and, uh, you know, iPhone level penetration, um, the sooner we are going to see progress in the field. Uh, and of course, it's extremely important to recognize this problem and also the opportunity. So it's not about only living um, longer and uh, declining. What about if we have a moonshot project uh, and try to increase our performance. Uh, so and why do we need aging clocks? Um, well, first of all, uh, you need to figure out ways to test geroprotective interventions. So drugs that uh, uh, delay or reverse aging and also to uh, prevent all kinds of risks. So those are the two major uh, areas where these clocks are used. You already got a few lectures on clocks uh, uh, during Brian's webinar series and I don't think you need to hear it all again from me. Uh, there are multiple clocks out there. The first one was Horvath's epigenetic aging clock. So if you do um, uh, mean absolute error uh, on, uh, on a test set, uh, it's about 3.6 years accurate. So on training, it's about 2.7 years accurate. Uh, then it's Hanum epigenetic aging clock, Peter's transcriptomic aging clock. Those are very early clocks. So it's 2013, 2015. Uh, they, these were developed using shallow machine learning techniques uh, but still, it's fundamental. That's why it's called for the genetic aging clock. So how can AI help? Well, first of all, deep learning um, ev uh, emerged around 2013, 2014, uh, with the advent of ImageNet uh, competition, where uh, deep neural networks uh, outperformed humans in image recognition for the first time. So in that time frame, 2013, 2014, that's where most of the progress uh, became visible and many technology converged. So now you can predict age with reasonable accuracy, but it still fails. So actually, just when we were calibrating, I took an unsolicited picture. I hope you, <laughs> you don't mind. Uh, you can see that it's, it's highly inaccurate. And I used the Microsoft system to kind of demonstrate that. <laughs> um, but uh, deep neural networks, they are trained on, uh, uh, on massive data sets. Uh, and uh, uh, when you are talking about, uh, I, I also wanted to show you, show you this picture, is that the, 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 uh, because uh, the, those predictions depend on many, many, many factors, right? Uh, lighting conditions, uh, 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 all kinds of uh, orientation of the head, etc. So you're going to see the same problems with other data types, not all non-imaging non, non data types. In biology, it's very similar because transcriptomics, proteomics, it also jumps all the time, right? Depending on the quality of the experiment, you're gonna see uh, different error rates. Um, uh, so you really need to figure out how to make AI better. And uh, one area in AI that I'm focused on very much is called generative adversarial networks. And of course, reinforcement learning, 
Uh, and this technology allows you to generate really amazing synthetic data. So uh, the technology emerged also around 2014 uh, with the work of Ian Goodfellow, who pioneered the approach. Um, uh, back then, he was at the University of Montreal, later on Google, now at Apple. A uh, really amazing uh, scientist who came up with this concept of two deep neural networks competing with each other. One is generating meaningful noise in response to, uh, uh, to generation conditions, uh, to textual input, for example. Uh, and another is a policeman, it's called the discriminator, which is uh, basically checking whether the generator is, uh, is generating ground truth. So, or something close to ground truth. And they are competing with each other. Uh, and uh, uh, after many, many iterations, they start generating, generating very high quality uh, data. So those pictures that you see uh, on the screen right now uh, are pictures of people who do not exist. So they were uh, designed by AI in 2017, again, early days. Uh, and those were just pioneering papers. People did not really care about the quality as much. So those people do not exist. You basically say, I want to see a white male with a beard uh, and uh, with uh, um, uh, brown hair of a uh, certain age. And uh, uh, the, uh, the system will generate a distribution of those faces. Some will be looking weird, some will be looking like this. And now they are indistinguishable from reality. And you can take this inspiration and put it into biological domain. So, or chemistry. So at Ancilico, we're actually using the same technique to generate novel chemical matter that goes outside the known chemical space. So that's where we do most of the work now. And we do the same in biology, generating gene expression profiles of people who do not exist. So we actually own this data now as well. Um, so you, you, you don't need to uh, even credit uh, those actors if you generate them in, 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 in AI. So this generative reinforcement learning uh, deep generative reinforcement learning. So basically those deep fake uh, creating algorithms, you can also teach them a strategy. And that, that they can be used for biological age prediction, biomarker development, biological target identification, protein design, molecular generation. And I published many papers in that area. Um, clinical trial analysis. So you can generate uh, you know, people in the future uh, using aging research and see how they are going to be responding to the drug. And just recently, if I will have a few a few minutes, I'll show you some recent study that we've uh, published. You can now uh, you can now work in mental health, depression, motivation, behavioral modification. So you can now use AI to understand human psychology. That's the really cool thing. Uh, and deep longevity. So the spin-up out of Ancilico, that's now part of the public company. Uh, we are using this technology for biological age prediction primarily, but also for real world data analytics and even uh, mental health. So again, those uh, generated, uh, generated images, uh, this is again, Microsoft, uh, how old? Uh, I, I like using the system just for the show. Um, we have our own systems uh, for imaging. It's just, these guys were actually the first one. Uh, you can see that even generated images, uh, the system predicts it, uh, predicts those uh, images pretty much like you would, right? Even though they're completely synthetic. So they carry a lot of biological information. And uh, uh, one of the things that kind of I think I invented um, because we published in 2016 and started this work in 2015, pre uh, pre uh, presented at multiple conferences uh, is that you would use deep neural networks to predict age on pretty much any data type. Uh, so we, we, we showed that on transcriptome, on proteome, on methylome, and now you can also do multi-model. So you can train on multiple data types at the same time because age is a universal feature that's, uh, that unifies pretty much everything, right? So everybody has age. Not everybody has uh, diabetes, not everybody has Alzheimer's. People are different, but one feature they usually have is age. So that means that there is abundant data types that are very often dirty. So they're not super high quality uh, but they always have one feature in them, age, and you are not using this feature in the input layer, so this uh, orange layer. You are trying to use other data types to predict this feature. Uh, actually, if you look at other aging clocks, like for example, uh, PhenoAge and others, they integrate uh, the chronological age is input feature. So uh, that's kind of cheating, right? So you want to, to get, capture very um, high quality biological insights 
out of many data types and previously incompatible data types, how do you compare, uh, com compare for example, or integrate EEG and transcriptome, right? This is difficult uh, because uh, you only have slices of the transcriptomes, right? So in time, uh, so you don't have continuous. So deep neural network allow you to do this uh, and they are now interpretable. So you can derive biological pathways, targets, causal graphs, uh, synthetic data, generation could be done with this technology. So you train deep neural networks on massive longitudinal data types, uh, data sets that have age uh, uh, as, as a feature. And then you can interpret those data sets to see which features are more important, create histograms of features. Uh, and that's a very powerful tool for many things because age is the most important feature in your life, right? And actually, well, kind of age of death is probably the most important feature in your life, right? Because that's when it ends. And that's another important feature to predict. predict. Uh, and we can do that with uh, deep aging clocks. So those deep aging clocks uh, started, again, I think that we published uh, the first peer-reviewed one. Um, so we published the first one in 2016. I'm going to show you that work. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a clock that's based on just regular blood tests, something that you can get in the clinic. And very often, you actually need to work with the data that's available because it's just uh, uh, there is so much of this data out there, just very basic blood tests. You need to just figure out which ones, uh, which, which data sets are coming from healthy people, right? And then you test uh, and maybe retrain sometimes on disease. So we published a bunch of clocks. Uh, uh, the first one was on uh, blood tests. So it's mean absolute error was about five years. So I can predict you plus minus five years. Uh, see, actually it, it did better. Uh, it, would, it would do better than uh, this Microsoft.net uh, on these uh, you know, um, uh, low resolution picture. Um, we also did it on transcriptomics, uh, microbiome, uh, X-ray, facial images, physical activity, um, and published a bunch of papers over time, right? So the first one we published around 2016. Uh, we then, uh, of course, tested it on many, many um, uh, different applications. Uh, and then we went into different data types. Uh, and um, Currently, we have a collection of clocks. So I have uh, the most kind of workhorse, the, the major workhorse is the deep hematological aging clock. That's the um, uh, deep neural network, which is trained on blood tests on different number of features from blood tests uh, that predicts your age and also mortality. Uh, we also have transcriptomic aging clock. I think that transcriptomic and proteomic aging clocks are the most valuable because you can derive actionable targets from those and put them back into pathways. Uh, microbiomic aging clock. So we also published uh, uh, a clock there, the first one. Uh, we have medical history-based aging clocks, photo aging clocks, methylation. So we just published the deep methylation aging clock, uh, uh, the, the, the accuracy on test uh, is 2.7 years, heart rate variability aging clocks, and even psychological aging clocks. If I have a couple minutes, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, and the first study that we published, uh, we uh, first or demonstrated at conferences, and then 2016, it got accepted. Um, so we took uh, 62,000 samples from more or less healthy individuals, um, 41 normalized markers. So we're talking about you know albumin, glucose, alkaline phosphatase, etc. So very sim sim simple blood tests, uh, and trained 21 deep neural nets to just predict age, and then we stacked them into an ensemble. And again, that was 2016, 2015. Um, that was before, you know, TensorFlow became full popular. So it was very difficult to actually even find people who can do it. Uh, and uh, uh, we published it in, uh, um, uh, in aging in uh, 2016. Uh, and we also show that we can reason with reasonable accuracy predict that, well, patient sex. It's like 98%. Uh, the accuracy of that particular clock was about 5.5 years. And we started noticing that people who are predicted older, they usually have some problem uh, consistently. So, and they have all kinds of risks. And people who are predicted younger, uh, they are actually very fit. So not always, sometimes it's also a sign of a problem. Uh, so we started looking at where those, uh, those, those uh, clocks can be applied. Uh, and we showed uh, in another study, which is called Population Specific Biomarkers of Human Aging, published in 2018, uh, we showed that first of all, uh, those clocks are very population specific. So. Uh, Canadians, Koreans, Euro Eastern Europeans, uh, uh, they are predicted uh, to be, um, like if you train deep neural network to uh, predict Canadian a uh, Asian Canadians, uh, and then test this network on Koreans, Koreans look slightly, slightly younger, or almost the same. And actually that's very well correlates with uh, 
life expectancy. If you test them on Eastern Europeans, uh, they, they actually look older. So, and that also correlates with uh, life expectancy. Uh, and we also uh, tested this, uh, like every one of those clocks and also the universal clock that is not population specific anymore uh, on enhanced data set. That's the US, uh, big US longitudinal data set that also has blood tests and mortality. And we showed that people who are five years or older than their chronological age have much higher hazard ratio, so the probability of dying of any cause, uh, than people who are predicted within their chronological age or uh, people who are predicted to be younger or five years uh, or younger than the chronological age, they actually have lower hazard ratio. So that's huge, right? So it basically means we can now predict uh, uh, mortality reasonably well and all kinds of risks. We also showed that in 2018 um, in uh, nation scientific reports that smokers, uh, and we did a study in Canadians and all Koreans, uh, smokers are predicted to be significantly older than their chronological age, um, especially in the uh, younger age. So in the older age, that difference goes down because people who are smoking and live to, you know, maybe 70 to 80, so, so uh, they, they are just genetically more resilient to aging. And so uh, they, they, they basically uh, survive smoking as well. Um, and um, we also published the microbiome, microbiomic aging clock. Uh, it's hugely variable data types, right? So it depends very much on what you eat. And if you drink alcohol, it's gonna uh, dramatically change your microbiome. Um, but we, we, we showed that we can predict your uh, age with 5.9 mean absolute error. And then we also deconvoluted those uh, uh, predictors into bacteria that make you look younger or older to the deep neural net. So if you want to design a nutraceutical and well, or uh, 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 probiotic on that, uh, you, can, you can actually can. So you can make your uh, gut microbiome look younger to the deep neural network. That does not necessarily mean that you are going to be younger because we don't know what's cause and effect here, right? Um, we also just recently published, uh, um, uh, that was two, mo two months ago, actually one, uh, well, last month, December, um, uh, two months ago, uh, December, uh, the deep methylation aging clock. So uh, using deep learning, uh, to predict age using uh, using whole meth methylome. Uh, and we went to 2.7 years mean absolute error. So now plus minus 2.7 years. Uh, as you know, this, this data type is extremely predictive of age. Uh, so we decided to just go and, 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 and publish the very accurate uh, aging clock uh, without having uh, aging on as input parameters. Uh, so age is an input parameter. And it works very well in different aging group, uh, different uh, population groups, and also works very well uh, in different uh, age groups. So also in, works very well in very very old people. Um, but uh, again, there are many clocks. So how do you come up with something more universal? So we decided to come up with a metric called age metric, which integrates multiple aging clocks, and. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's impossible to say which clock is better or worse. So if you are trying to say, okay, well, uh, you know, transcriptomic aging clock is better than epigenetic aging clock, it's, it's wrong because they measure different things. And sometimes uh, also, um, so my no new philosophy is that sometimes if you are optimizing for increased performance, and if you're, for example, exercising in young age or in middle age, um, it is good for you, right? It uh, gives you more performance. Uh, you might actually even look younger to the deep neural net uh, on some data types. Uh, but as you get older, uh, the same level of stress from exercise, for example, at least to more damage. So your stem cell niches are already um, old. Uh, you've got fibrosis, uh, 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 crosslinks, uh, you've got advanced glycation end products, you've got mineralization of connective tissue. So those uh, uh, stem cells that you are inducing to uh, uh, satellite cells in the muscle that you are inducing to, to, to divide and proliferate, they cannot do that anymore effectively. And you're actually damaging the tissue without the regeneration. So it might be bad for you as well. And you might look older to the deep neural net on some, a, so, so, some, um, uh, some clocks, but some clocks would show you younger. So uh, you really need to test them in many, many applications to see what you want to optimize for. So that's why we came up with this integrated clock that uh, you know, if you develop a clock on some data types that we don't know, uh, we can actually plug it and put it in this, uh, into the system. Uh, so we are aging clock agnostic. We want to check all aging clocks and uh, uh, incorporate as much data. 
also of often consumers, uh, they do not have um, advanced data types like you know gene expression or protein expression. They just have pictures, voice, uh, text. Uh, they can answer some questions. They can take a blood test uh, uh, from their physician and put it in a system. So we try to help build it as a snowball, right? So the more data you have, you get uh, much, much, much more visibility uh, and granularity into your health. And some of those clocks uh, move at different rates. We now tangibly see it. Uh, so currently we started providing those, uh, uh, those age metric reports to clinics. So we started basically working with the doctors, with advanced doctors who are sp specializing in preventative medicine uh, at some top institutions and uh, looking at how uh, they can work with the patients in the preventative medicine space uh, to measure those clocks of course, in a research mode. So it's not clinically approved, but at the same time, aging is not yet a disease. So it's possible to do that without outside the kind of regulatory framework. So uh, we just need to ensure that we don't get this data uh, ourselves. And um, uh, we have the basic uh, aging clocks uh, that basically behavior age, photo age, blood age, anamnesis age, objective age, so something that's very easily accessible. Uh, and then advanced, it's methylation, microbiome, transcriptome. It's already integrated into the um, Geometric report. And we started providing those reports and also supplementing them with an app. So we have an app that you can download from Apple Store um, called young.ai uh, or go to young.ai website and also uh, try to play around with it with yourself and then maybe with your patients. And all of that is integrated. So we basically have the longevity cloud that integrates uh, all, of those, uh, uh, all of those technologies. Uh, and we are trying to get into personalized longevity first. So of course we want to see how, you know, what your mother told you, uh, like diet, exercise, uh, behavior, uh, positive attitude, uh, food, um, very basic uh, uh, nutraceuticals, how they affect your rate of aging on different uh, levels. Um, and we're trying to provide that to the clinics. So of course the workhorse uh, algorithm that we provide is the blood, blood age. Um, so based on multiple parameters, either on 31 markers. So again, those are markers that you would get from a regular visit to your GP anyway, uh, or more advanced uh, 39 markers where we uh, add additional parameters. But usually uh, people who go for executive healthcare, they get even more, they get more than 70 parameters. Uh, so we have some uh, markers that work uh, on, on, on very large data sets, as well, the uh, feature sets as well. Uh, and how it works, you uh, come to your physician, take a simple blood test uh, uh, that you would get anyway for, for your routine blood check. Uh, request the report, review it, make some changes, and then follow up. Uh, and we also started using our generative adversarial networks to ask the deep neural network, where do these parameters need to be in order for you to look, let's say, five years younger? And of course, there are multiple strategies for that. So that is a really cool. AI advancement here, right? So we are trying to uh, ask the deep neural net, what features do we need to change in order to look younger? And then provide those reports and we'll basically say, okay, even your cholesterol is within the reference range for your age group. Uh, if you change it a little bit and change, let's say iron, uh, you would look five years younger. Uh, and then the physician can very easily tailor your regimen to, to, to look younger to the deep neural net. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be younger, but let's try consistently. We also start integrating wearables. So the app is also connected to your Apple Watch, uh, and we try to derive uh, some biological insights from uh, activity data and try to link it with other data types. Uh, and uh, our idea, our ultimate goal, that's what we are striving towards, is to create an uh, age-driven uh, or aging clock-driven ecosystem uh, bring, bringing together clinics and insurance companies, life insurance and health insurance, because uh, those two um, stakeholders, their interests are aligned. So if you are coming for life insurance, uh, you actually likely want to live longer, right? And most likely are quite wealthy if you want to have a large, a large life insurance. Um, and you don't want to die too quickly. And the insurance company also wants you to live longer because uh, they don't want you to die too quickly so you stop paying the premiums. Uh, and uh, we try to uh, align the, the interest of those stakeholders through aging clocks to see where they can intervene to help you to live longer together. But of course, we also um, now work with some pharma companies 
uh, to provide aging clocks for clinical trials, because sometimes there are drugs, they don't even know which data type it works on, right? Uh, so if you get a simple, stupid feature like predicted age, and you consistently see in the clinical study that uh, somebody, that, that the population that your patient cohort gets older or younger on microbiome, it means that there is an effect at least on microbiome, not necessarily on some individual feature, but on all the features combined. Uh, and of course, we want to also cater to the beauty clinics because actually I was not, uh, I didn't really care about how people look before uh, I did the psychological aging study. Uh, I think actually looking younger is probably, probably also has some bene beneficial effects because you look in the mirror every day and then you, oh, actually I look younger um, than my chronological age. So you feel happier and you actually have more uh, strive to live longer. Uh, so there is a link. And currently we are trying to uh, cater to clinics, insurance companies, employers, and it's not just talk. So we started partnering with really advanced clinics. So the most advanced we've partnered to date uh, is Human Longevity. So that's Craig Venturi's startup, now uh, cheered by a wonderful, amazing scientist, Dr. Uh, Ko Weiwu, Wei Wu Ho, um, uh, a Chinese American who founded many, many companies uh, that went IPO, uh, turned into billion dollar enterprises. So last year he had uh, uh, one of the biggest IPOs uh, uh, in, uh, of, of a company in the States, diagnostic company. Uh, so billion dollars, uh, do dollar IPO. Uh, so he also chairs uh, Human Longevity now, and we partnered. He also invested in Deep Longevity um, for, uh, through, through a Human Longevity Associated Venture Fund. Uh, and now you can do aging clocks on really advanced, uh, very well curated data sets, uh, specifically on uh, uh, lab tests. So if you come to Human Longevity, you can actually get an aging clock report from us. Uh, and we would be able to analyze that in the context of other data types. And we, of course, started partnering with many other advanced clinics, uh, uh, so currently it's 12 clinics that uh, partnered with uh, Deep Longevity uh, and many more are coming. Some of them are networks. Some are covering very large number of uh, uh, patients and doctors. And we started facing a problem. So it's very difficult to uh, work in the space unless you have doctors buy-in. And not every doctor uh, has the time to get into this uh, industry and understand what, what, what we're doing and understand the value because you are actually, you're not, you don't need to generate additional data, data in order for, for you to take the hematological aging clock, for example, you, you, you do it anyway. So um, we started a course called Longevity Medicine for Physician and it went viral. So in December, it, it was, uh, you know, 768 students when we launched uh, in December and now it's uh, uh, 2.6 thousand. Uh, and we launched it on Udemy, which actually requires you to charge something. So the minimum was uh, $19. Um, and now we're running constantly promotion campaigns where we're making it free. And hopefully next month, we will put it into the uh, public domain on longevity.degree. And there will be a few other courses. So now I will spend just maybe one minute, okay? Well, one and a half minutes on uh, the topic, which is very dear to my heart. Uh, so... Uh, we, we thought, okay, well, since we are so good at predicting age using biological data types, and we know that people change in time, uh, have changed their behavior in time due to various life events. And of course, we're evolutionary designed to, uh, we developed during evolution to strategically self-deceive ourselves in the context of, in the, in the, in the, in the view of imminent decline and uh, demise and death. Uh, after reaching the peak, I'm sorry, I have to be, uh, I have to use those blunt words. Um, so you reach 40 and after that, it's all downhill, right? So uh, evolution made us uh, so, so that we don't, uh, you know, kill ourselves or start killing others or don't hurt ourselves. So we start getting happier. We change our priorities. We start optimizing for other um uh, other uh, uh, goals rather than reproduction. So we care for the young, we find some other tasks, right? We try to give, get more money or to, you know, get into politics or whatever. So our psychology behavior changes and we try to figure out how to, how to, uh, how to track it, how to track those changes. Uh, and we came up with, of course, two features. One is subjective age. Subjective age is how old do you feel? And uh, 
and uh, that's the, probably the best marker of your <laughs> age in general, because you are the best biomarker of, I mean, you feel yourself, right? So if you feel 30 when you are 50, it's a good sign. Uh, unfortunately, you have never been 60, right, if you are 50. Uh, so it's hard to say if you if you feel older. So most of the people, they feel much younger than their, their chronological age, so we can use the delta. And the uh, psycho age, psychological age, that's your chronological age in a healthy state, right? So we are predicting those two features. And we also decided to look at features that only come from modifiable factors. So uh, something that you can change. So like health status, education, you cannot change, you know, parental age or kids age or age of death of family members. Uh, that's not changeable, right? And some of those features are very correlated with your chronological age, right? Especially uh, like the the, uh, the kids age, right? If you, if you have kids, that means that, uh, or spouse's age, uh, that's very correlated to chronological age. So if, if you put this feature as input parameter, uh, the deep neural network will, you know, optimize for, uh, will, will recognize this as the most important feature. So you're trying to go for modifiable factors. And we are predicting those two, uh, two features. And then we're looking at how those two features affect, you know, your biological age, mental health, physical health, et cetera. Uh, so I, I know that I'm already out of time. So we created a deep neural net. Uh, we took um, the MIDAS data set. It's the populational sociological and psychological survey in the States um, that's open. So, you, uh, and thank you, uh, you know, United States for making this data available. Uh, for research and uh, for, uh, for, for, for everybody to use, right? And we must acknowledge that uh, most of the biological and psychological research is funded by the states and that uh, that's, that's the ultimate driver of the you know, uh, innovation in the, in the world. Uh, so this data set is available, uh, you can take it and it's a lot of survey questions over time. So of course the goal is not to track your biological age to understand what people, uh, what people think, right? Uh, over time and uh, what they do. Um, also, the, lots of demographics. So we took a lot of anonymized survey data, uh, designed a deep neural net to predict age, and then we did multiple steps of feature selection. So looked at what features uh, are predictive and what features are important, uh, which features are modifiable and not directly correlated with uh, chronological age. So we came up with a set of 50 features, trained the deep neural networks, so psycho age and subj age, and actually got reasonable accuracy. And then we, decon we showed that those predictive, predicted numbers, predicted values are also very correlated with mortality. So this is huge. You can now modify your psychology. You can now uh, change several par parameters in, your, um, uh, in, in the way you think, in the way you behave, uh, in the way you perceive the world very easily, right? So Laura Carstensen from Stanford, she showed that now your longevity horizon is plastic. So you can change this with various interventions, very, very simple ones. So you just believe that you're going to live longer and you are going to live longer, most likely. Um, and now, of course, other features. We show uh, what, what, what uh, factors are most important uh, for mortality prediction, right? Uh, also put it on more kind of classical psychological frameworks. Uh, and, you know, uh, if you want to get something fun and useful from this lecture, well, you can now change your behavior. Uh, you can change your health, mental state with deep psychological aging clocks and optimistic attitude towards health and longevity decreases both psychological and subjective age. And if you religiously convince yourself that you are going to live significantly longer than uh, the actuarial tables in your country, uh, your, the, the age of death of uh, your grandparents and parents and your peers, uh, you can actually escape that uh, you know, peer pressure and peer, um, peer attitude towards age. Uh, and think about yourself as a younger individual. Most likely it's going to be benefiting, benefiting you in many, many ways. So listen to Brian's lectures, uh, webinars, and uh, tell your friends to do that because the more educated you are in this area, uh, the more likely it is that you are going to convince, convince yourself to, that you are going to live longer. So I'll, I'll stop here and uh, yeah, uh, want to invite you to our annual conference uh, that we run every, every year. This year, it's going to be 31st of August to the 3rd of September. Uh, last year, 2.5 thousand people participated, and it's going to be at Columbia University. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm on WeChat, so you can easily contact me. And thank you, Brian, for in inviting me to speak. Thanks a lot, Alex. You know, um...
you know, I just one brief thing before we get into it, because we don't have a lot of time, but I just, as some of you listeners know, I just went through two weeks of quarantine coming back to Singapore. And I've been following your Instagram. And it seems like you've been in quarantine most of last year. I mean, <laughs> how many times did you go through quarantine? <laughs> I went through quarantine uh, three times. Wow. I don't know how you survived that. I barely got through one time. Uh, well, my favorite one was in mainland China. It's a real kind of uh, really amazing quarantine. I love being quarantined there. <laughs> uh, I <laughs> bet. <laughs> so, you know, that. let's get back to this, the, la- the end to start with. Uh, and the psychology uh, clock and, and, you know, how associative and how causal is that? So, you know, you can make predictions based on that data, but do we know that if you could really change your mindset that it would affect the biology? And, and I mean, where, where does causation and corral, uh, correlation come together in this? So the only biological signal that we can claim right now is mortality risk. Right. Mm -hmm. So because uh, those data sets are linked to mortality, so we can tangibly show that people who are predicted to be younger on both psychological and subjective age uh, clocks, they they are like less likely to um, to die too early. Uh, I mean, I tend to believe the conclusion. It seems to make sense to me, but you could seems like you could make the argument that they believe that because they're healthier. Yes. Can you exclude so, that possibility? We, we, we of course, uh, are looking at that as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, we found some very strange features too. Uh, like, for example, your attitude to, you know, your future sex life. A uh, very big feature. Uh, and in some age, it's actually kind of, I guess, difficult to... Uh, <laughs> uh, I've never been 60, right, or 70 or 80, so I'm not sure how it feels then, but inferring from talking to others, uh, I think it's, it's reasonably difficult, but those features are, uh, you can, so, so you can probably modify them, right? It's just uh, kind of also tells you the direction we need to take uh, uh, when, when designing some of our interventions, right? So we probably need to make people a little bit more attractive and looking younger in, 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 in the mirror, right? So kind of tells you the benefit of cosmetics and interventions. I previously thought it's complete crap, right? But now I think that it's probably is beneficial. So the way you perceive yourself in the mirror is, 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 is a feature. Um, then, uh, uh, of course, how long do you expect to live? That is a huge feature. And if that, and that is a modifiable feature, Right, that, that feature can be modified through uh, education, through positive attitude, through you know longevity research, uh, and uh, um, that is likely to be causal, right? But we, we cannot make a claim because I cannot tell you whether you know some of those features are causal or they are more um, the result of, uh, of, uh, of, of aging. But one other important thing is that the work of Laura Carstensen out of Stanford, so I deeply admire her work. She came up with, uh, the social, social emotional selectivity theory. I actually interviewed her for my Forbes blog. Um, so she showed that aging, perceived aging, this perceived age is plastic. So uh, you can actually modify somebody's behavior by uh, in asking the person to imagine that their doctor calls them and says, look, now you are gonna be living longer, right? Or you have a problem, you're gonna live soon, or you're gonna die soon. Uh, and your your attitude to life, your behavior is going to change based on that um, on that modification. Of course, there are many other modifications, right? I mean, so, in a sense, it's a manifestation of placebo effect. Yeah, so it might be a placebo effect. We haven't tied it to the biological features yet, uh, primarily because for me, it's some kind of extracurricular activity now, right? Uh, yeah. I never thought. I don't, I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, uh, the, the placebo effect is real. We don't understand it, but you know, when people yeah. believe they're gonna, their drugs are gonna act better or whatever, they, there's a lot of data that suggests that it works better. So um, I, I didn't mean to be casting aspersions on it. I think that it just reminds me of that sort of uh, literature, which is small, but growing. Yeah. So again, I think that positive attitude to longevity uh, in general and basically wanting to be younger uh, and living longer, uh, that is likely to have this kind of placebo effect, but I wouldn't even call it placebo effect. We need to have uh, 
professional psychologists working in that. Yeah. Because yeah. currently, if you look at developmental psychology or lifespan psychology, people do not look at those features and they don't try to set uh, uh, set this as, an, as their objective. So we might, you know, be inventing a new field here. Let's, let's, let's take a shot at defining something because a lot of our people watching have been hearing about AI. So you mentioned generative adversarial networks. How would you define that in say 30 to 60 seconds? So you, uh, you have two deep neural networks uh, that are competing with each other. So one is taking some input parameters to produce uh, something that satisfies those input parameters. And another uh, deep neural network is trying to check whether the uh, first network correctly uh, generated the data or the object that you need um, with those parameters. Uh, so one is the generator, another one is a discriminator. So they compete with each other. One is trying to generate much better fakes and another is trying to identify whether the fake is close to ground truth. So, and this constant competition allows you to build uh, generative cell networks that generate very high quality data that is indistinguishable from reality, from ground, ground truth, at least to us. And currently there is uh, the entire field of research on how to, uh, to create those, what was called adversarial attacks. So you, um, uh, you uh, try to uh, show something to, to, to the deep neural net and it gets so confused that it doesn't really understand whether uh, it's true or false, right? Or whether it's, uh, uh, whether this object is real or not, uh, or how close it is to ground truth. Um, so uh, currently those GANs, we use them to generate really high quality gene expression data, for example. And uh, internally, and I showed it at a couple of conferences a while ago, uh, you can train on, let's say, 100,000 uh, uh, people, uh, the, the G G generative adversarial networks that can cre create uh, uh, gene expression profiles with specific age, uh, right? So you train on all uh, uh, on the entire data set, and uh, then you are trying to generate something that is uh, uh, individuals that are, let's say, 60, 70, 80, right? From, uh, from a template of a 40-year-old individual and then since there are longitudinal data sets, so people who have been uh, sampled before, like at, uh, at 50 and at 60, currently that's the problem. So there are not no great longitudinal um, gene expression analysis data sets. Uh, and you can see that uh, it predicts very well. Yeah, um, just to let everybody know, I think what we're gonna, if you don't mind, we're gonna run about five, seven minutes late. Uh, well, I, I wanna I, I, ask I, a couple more questions. You, right. Um, and then I'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, you know, one thing that struck me is you're using AI to try to predict new chemical entities that might have properties and you're using AI to try to measure age, which could be the outcome. So can you combine those two things together? In other words, you can, you can identify molecules that might affect specific patterns of biologic age and predict the outcome of that without doing an experiment. Is it possible to merge those two types of AI together yet? So we published a paper on that uh, recently. Um, and we didn't use aging there because it's kind of more of an uh, in silico medicine work. We showed that now we can g generate uh, uh, novel molecular entities uh, with the parameters that induce certain transcriptional response. So you basically with the desired transcriptional response, or uh, basically you, you want certain um, gene expression pattern in a certain cell line, uh, we can generate the molecule that will do that or come as close to that as possible. So of course you can uh, try to make it younger, right? But that would require to, to, to get a younger uh, gene expression uh, profile, right? A protein expression profile. Um, but we have not done that. It would be an interesting thing to do, uh, but at In Silico, we are not doing as much uh, of, uh, uh, you know, aging research, drug discovery as we used to. We, of course, support a lot of uh, pharma companies on synolytic discovery and antifibrotic and uh, uh, DNA damage DNA repair. But uh, uh, we don't we don't do this kind of experiments anymore at In Silico um, that I've just described, right? But that's a great idea. So we we tried it, worked, uh, but only for let's say down-regulating certain kinases that are important in cancer, for example. 
but so, you, it can be done. Yeah. One last question, and I'll, and I'll turn it over. Uh, you have this nice graph of you know completely escaping the aging paradigm and improving function. How far are we away from that? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Uh, you probably are a better judge of that. Um, uh, I just think that we need to be very optimistic and set uh, bigger goals than um, than are achievable, or well, sorry, that than are uh, easily imaginable uh, in in the foreseeable future in order for us to come close uh, or to, to to make progress. Otherwise, we'll be just dancing around diet, exercise, and sleep, right? And uh, uh, we won't get that much progress. If you look at how Elon Musk does it, right? I mean, you want to do uh, tunnels. Well, you do it in your backyard, right? And uh, uh, you want to go to Mars? Well, you build a rocket company. So I think we need this kind of attitude in longevity as well, or at least in some kind of pockets of uh, innovation. Yeah. Well, let me uh, bring in Max, who's been collating some of the audience questions and may have some of his own too. Uh, so uh, Max, what's going on? So we actually got like a lot of questions from the audience and I think we cannot go to all of them, but I picked out a few that uh, in a way show like what people are thinking or asking about. Um, CT asks, um, with the microbiome clock, can we predict based on skin microbiome data? Uh, so we know it's possible, but we have not done this, uh, this experiment. And it also depends on where do you sample this microbiome from. If you sample from the from from hands that are regularly washed, it's probably going to be much more difficult than doing it, uh, uh, you know, from your armpits, uh, vaginal microbiome, or uh, or nasal mi microbiome. Uh, but I'm pretty sure it is possible. It's just the error rate is going to be different. And uh, uh, I haven't seen anybody who has done that, but. Since we did it on gut microbiome and it worked very re reasonably well, um, I, I think it should be done on uh, on skin microbiome. It would be a neat experiment. Cool. Then we have like another question from Raquel. Um, do you think all the organs are aging similarly with chronological age? If not, ideally, we should have biomarkers for each organ? Uh, yes, of course. And many groups are working on that. Uh, so we, we, we demonstrated uh, uh, tissue-specific aging clocks in uh, uh, transcriptomics. We actually patented them in, I think, 2017, uh, deep aging clocks um, that work in different uh, organs. Uh, and uh, we show that uh, um, uh, some organs age faster uh, and some organs age slower. And in different individuals, uh, it might be th 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 those trends might be reversed. So from what I've seen is that the lung, uh, liver, so fast regenerating organs are actually uh, aging faster. Uh, so lung, liver, uh, kidney, um, they age very quickly. And then they also have systemic effects uh, on other tissues. Um, and uh, if I were to start you know, human regeneration and rejuvenation, I would start with the lung. And of course, liver and kidney. <laughs> It's good that we have uh, had, had that tip talking about the lung earlier. That's like on spot then. Yeah. Uh, Robert wants to know what kind of measurement or instrumentation would, you, in your opinion, provide the greatest predictive power for aging clocks if it were available? And are there any attempts to using breadth based data? Well, the best instrumentation to predict your chronological age, uh, if it's for chronological age, the best instrument is your passport. Uh, if it is, uh, and the next best thing is probably the genetic aging clock or the uh, image of your retinal. So retinal imaging currently provides the most accurate prediction of chronological age to my knowledge. So it's basically almost on spot, better, better than epigenetics. Let me um, just jump in there and say, what does on spot mean? Because, you know, we interpret the error uh, to be the biologic age. Uh, and, and so what is the optimal error? I mean, if, if you predict to like half a year, we, I think aging is more variable than that. So, you yeah. know, what are we trying to optimize to here? Well, if you are optimizing for uh, accuracy to predict your chronological age. No, I, I mean uh, biological. Yeah. So I, I was talking about chronological yeah, age. Yeah, sorry. But if you are doing biological age, uh, that, 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 that varies a lot. Again, different organs mm -hmm. age at different rates. Uh, and, uh, uh, different data types show you different things. So you've got uh, uh, mul multifactorial problems here. Uh, and uh, some clocks, you want them to be highly variable. You actually want them because uh, individually, we don't, we don't die at the same time, right? 
So you want you want those clocks to be um, uh, there. There is a good question: What is a biological clock, right? So biological aging clock. Does do you want to see the performance, or do you want to see how long you're going to live? So those are two different uh, uh, two different features that you're optimizing for. Mm -hmm. So if you're optimizing for how long you're going to live, then you actually want to have uh, uh, some clocks that are hugely variable, right? Because some people live you know, 50 years or longer than others. So you want your clock to show that. Mm -hmm. And for actuarial science, for example, yeah. if you want to perform, uh, you know, you need to get as close to the optimal age of 35, for example, right, for average. So you're actually looking the other way around. So how far you are from the peak. Yeah. So uh, in, and that's extremely important to understand that those clocks uh, measure different things. And uh, uh, some clocks that have huge mean absolute, uh, mean absolute error, uh, they actually are more reflective of what hap is happening in biology than those that are predicting your chronological age very accurately. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to predict chronological age. You want to pre predict the performance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and for that, I think the best clocks uh, would be transcriptonics. Yeah. Max, uh, sorry to interrupt. Cool. Um, Sama wants to know, does deep longevity factor in mental health, including anxiety, psychological stress, depression, when predicting the aging clock? And do you think there's an, any correlation between epigenetics and mental health, well-being, and consequently longevity? So for the first question, uh, yes, definitely there is. The, the, we, we demonstrated in this paper that we published, we demonstrated that there is a huge correlation with uh, different uh, mental disorders uh, using that clock. So you can actually, uh, if, if the person is predicted to be significantly older than their chronological age, usually they do have some problem. And it's a risk factor, right? So you can basically use that as a feature uh, to see if you need to you need mental counseling, right? Maybe longevity mental counseling. Uh, and second, we have not, uh, we have not tried uh, to correlate with epigenetic aging clock, so we don't know. Okay, cool. Maybe I have a question on that. You were like talking about psychological modification. How do you see like uh, psychedelics, like mushrooms that become like more and more important, right? In or like trials are running to impact the psychological age. To 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 be honest with you, I I cannot even uh, comment on that. To speculate on this subject, I think that if you are you know seventy and if you are taking psychedelics. Uh, most likely your attitude to life is very positive and uh, you, you are very optimistic about how long you're going to live. So uh, that's kind of cause and effect, right? So uh, <laughs> I wouldn't try to see, to, to, to test that causality, right? And later life, uh, let's do it when, well, in mice, they don't have uh, psychological age, right? I mean, when they have some behavioral age that would be interesting to study. Um, but definitely they don't try to change their behavior in the context of, I mean, they don't understand that they're going to die and, and, or maybe they do, um, mm -hmm. that they're going to die and, and, and decline, right? So uh, it's different features that are changing. So I, I won't be able to check this epigenetic, uh, uh, you know, clock in correlation with, with that. Um, uh, and also psychedelics, you know, it's a good, good question, actually. <laughs> uh, now that you think about it, right, you might want to do some, psychedelic longevity meditation uh, where you would convince people that, you know, they are younger and. Uh, well, you know, Max, you have like one more question. We're going to have to move this show to California if we keep talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, yeah, um, I can give you like one more question. Um, Larissa is asking, have you applied any of the deep aging clocks uh, to people with genetic diseases, um, especially those like uh, Procheria? And if yes, which diseases and what are the results? So uh, the, we, we have a collaboration and also uh, the lab in Copenhagen. So Morton Schreiber Knudsen's lab is doing quite a bit of that. And they are showing that uh, aging clocks can be used to predict, uh, for example, for pictures, definitely if you show a picture of a progeriac uh, uh, child to the network, they will be predicted older. Uh, and uh, in many other data types, it's the same. So, but on some data types, the, you will not see the difference. So, uh, but so far, it's uh, more it's Morton's uh, project, so I cannot talk about it. So, just uh, really quickly, I noticed that one of the big uh, risk scores for the psychologic clock was "Live for Today." Is that good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
yeah so if you have the the marshmallow test right so if you if you live for it tomorrow uh, i think that you are going to live significantly longer and you are going to um uh to to uh, um to be shown as uh, as as younger actually this in this feature it goes both 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 ways so if you are going outside the reference range it's good for you uh, so either you are trying to be the up, uh, ultimate marshmallow champion uh, or you are very young. So today you are thinking about today. Usually that's very correlated with uh, behavior of younger people. Well, I won't say which side I'm on for that. But, uh, <laughs> thanks, Alex. It's uh, great having you on the show. And I uh, hope we can see each other in person sometime soon. Yeah, well, thank you for doing this. And again, deep bow to uh, Singapore as a country and the uh, National University of Singapore uh, as an institution for doing this. It's uh, truly groundbreaking. And thank you, Brian, for spearheading this. And, great. Uh, um, I don't know anybody who is more published and uh, more well-known. Oh, thanks. Um, so I just want to remind everyone, you can click on the panelists and all attendees button and go to chat after the show. Uh, please also register for the next webinar. We're going to uh, continue the theme down the road of talking to companies in the longevity space. But um, next show, we're going to have Victor Zhao on, who's the president of the National Academy of Medicine. And this is the second year now for the Healthy Longevity Global Grand Challenge. And he'll be telling us how that's going. Um, by the way, uh, we're not going to have a show next week. For those of you not in Asia, people here have not figured out that January 1st is New Year's. They still think uh, it's a different date. They think it's February 12th this year. So we're going to cancel our show on the 11th. Uh, and I'll wish everybody happy Chinese New Year before I get in trouble. And then we'll be back on the 18th with Victor. Uh, before I leave you, um, I want to uh, leave you with some thoughts uh, on aging from a dame of the British Empire. Thanks a lot for coming to the show. I just want to go and work in. I have, you know, I just think if you put the car away in the garage, it's not going to start. And so I just want to keep going, doing something, doing something new, which is a challenge. I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime. Like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive I'm feeling so weightless Like I'm gonna make it And nothing in the universe can take this I can see it clearly now Nothing gonna bring me down